In today's video, we're gonna talk about how this box can save you in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fines and keep you off other federal watch lists. Now, some of you may be wondering, what is this box? And this is a commercial Faraday cage. This one's made by Ramsey, which is what I use for all my Faraday cages themselves. This is a smaller Faraday cage. They do come in much larger sizes. This is actually the smallest one that we use for testing. We have much larger ones that we use for testing, but I'm gonna move it off to the side just so it doesn't drive me crazy while I'm explaining what they are. If I were to explain it like you were five for a Faraday cage, Faraday cage blocks signals from coming in and interacting with the devices in there as well as it restricts the signals from leaving that box itself. Now in reality, it actually doesn't block them at all. It attenuates signal. This particular box and the other cages that we have built out, most of them will attenuate six gigahertz of frequency at about 90 dB which means that it doesn't eliminate the signal, it just becomes very, 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 very quiet to the device inside. And that attenuation becomes larger as we go down to lower frequencies uh, in itself. There are special Faraday cages which are des designed to operate at even higher attenuations for different sets of frequencies or tuned frequencies. But for, as a general box, this one does a great job. Now you might ask, who needs a Faraday cage? And that answer is, well, probably not a lot of people, but who wants a Faraday cage? Or what type of groups actually need them? So you have the extreme side, which are worried about an EMP attack happening and destroying electronics and making it so no one can communicate with items. These are generally what we would call, you know, end of the world preppers, uh, or also the US government holds this opinion. Uh, I have built cages and built systems to go into cages uh, before with other engineers who are much smarter than me uh, to provide resilience communications for first responders, uh, just in case of an EMP attack. There are also other individuals, which is more in line with what we use them for, who are doing research or some type of security work. And we're broadcasting on licensed frequencies. And licensed frequencies are frequencies which are either owned by the government or a commercial or other type of group that they've actually paid for. And it becomes their property. They have the exclusive right to use it. And if you are using it and denying their device the ability to use those spectrums, you are breaking the law. And the FCC, though I may bag on them, does serve a important role when it comes to enforcing that particular law. With that being said, you don't have to always use a Faraday cage. We like to use it, especially if we're doing something like a test on a cell phone, right? That's a licensed spectrum. We also would be denying E911 services if we were to pop up a base station for other folks if our um, cellular network that we built is not configured correctly or passes that through, as well as, you know, if we're testing, let's say, a uh, radio that we get from a military group or uh, a radio that we get from a group that maybe it's not their radio. You know, we wanna make sure that we are not broadcasting out on those frequencies. We also wanna make sure that whatever we are broadcasting from, uh, we're not emanating that out into the general air. So it's not just our broadcast, it's actually the device itself, it's the responses that we're getting from the device that we wanna block. There's a few different reasons why you wanna block that and this video is not really uh, you know, positioned to cover all those reasons. Maybe that will be another video in the future. But uh, these boxes themselves can save you tons of money because depending on what frequencies you are broadcasting on will depend on the type of punishment that you will get from the government. This can be as simple as getting a letter from the FCC which just says, hey, don't do that we didn't really appreciate that, and other people didn't appreciate it, and they noticed, and we noticed, to getting a legitimate fine. Uh, these fines can range in price, but you know, it's never fun to have to pay thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to the US government. You can have your equipment seized as well from the FCC, 
Uh, that will take the uh, broadcast equipment that is infringing on other spectrum. And depending on what type of uh, frequencies you are using, will also determine if there's any other legal action such as jail time. Now, if you're blocking, let's say, E911, so you're setting up a base station, you're blocking E911 services because you don't have it set up correctly or you have it set up as it's supposed to be set up or how actually law enforcement sets up uh, their rogue base stations or ISME catchers, whatever you want to call them. Not only are you broadcasting on licensed spectrum, you're also denying E911 services, which now makes you a domestic terrorist in the eyes of DHS. And being labeled that is definitely my least favorite thing to be labeled. Now let's see how one of these actually work, right? We've talked about them enough. I'm gonna call the MTI test phone number that reads your phone number back to you. That number is 800-444-4444. It's very hard to memorize, as you can tell. But I'll let you hear what it says, and then we'll call again and put it in the box. So this is what it will sound like. Thank you for calling MCI. Our system indicates you are calling from 202-456-1414. If this is the number you are calling about... Perfect. So let's do that again, but with the Faraday cage. So <clears throat> I'm just going to oh, put this right here. Here we go. going to call again. In Thank you for calling MCI. Our system is Ooh, silence. <laughs> Already killed it. It is important to know that there are other ways to conduct testing without having these Faraday cages in use. Uh, and I'll talk about that probably in a later video, how you can do these types of testing so that you both A, don't get fined, B, don't get put on more federal watch lists than you already are, and C, don't end up in jail because you're interfering with some legitimate service that can save people's lives. Now, some of you may be asking, what do you need in your Faraday cage configuration? And it really is dependent up to you, but I'll tell you what I have in mind. I have 10 gigabit ethernet. This is an older box, so we have USB 2.0 up here. We have HDMI right here, and we have eight SMA connectors. Uh, our current configuration uses uh, USB 3.0 or USB-C, uh, but that box is being used right now, so I'm not taking it out just for a demo video. With this, we do have power on the box as well, leading into a power strip on the inside, and we have exhaust fans on both sides. So we have a, a fan here, and we have an inlet here as well. So we can do a push or pull configuration depending on how we have the fan uh, in this. That is how we set up our general box. This is the standard build for Faraday cages. Now you may not need all that. You might just need two SMA uh, connectors. In fact, I've used and done many tests with boxes that have nothing but just two SMA pass-throughs on them. And that's totally fine. You don't need a fully fancy box. We have boxes that are even fancier and used for very specific testing. And, you know, we have boxes that are less fancy. We have one box, the first box I ever bought, that has, uh, you know, four SMA connectors and USB. And that's it. With power. With that, your configuration, just make sure you go with a reputable brand with Faraday boxes. Again, I use Ramsey. They're not a sponsor of this video or anything. I don't have any sponsors of videos. Red Mesa sponsors these videos, uh, <laughs> I guess you can say. But uh, they are the brand I've been using for the last decade, and their boxes have never let me down. So there are other brands out there, like I said, that are cheaper. I don't necessarily trust them. Uh, I've tested out many other cheaper brands that claim all types of great performance, but they just haven't delivered. These Ramsey boxes have always delivered what they've claimed, which is why I use them. Now you might think, oh, I can store my electronics in these. 
and I'll just get one of these. I don't have to have it, any configuration. I'll just get a big one and I'll store a ton of electronics in there, ham radio and such, and it will protect me from EMP. And the answer is it might, uh, but it also may not. And EMP is a very tricky subject itself. And again, out of the scope of this video, but don't think just because you have a Faraday cage or that you've designed your own Faraday cage or something like that. You watch a YouTube video and you have a 50 cal can Faraday cage uh, to protect your ham radio just in case an EMP attack happens, uh, which I will tell you most of those videos that I've seen online are absolute crap and they will not do anything for an actual EMP attack. But uh, this doesn't necessarily mean this will protect you against EMP uh, discharges. There will be other items that you have to do to a Faraday cage to protect against that. That's a Faraday cage. This device can, like I said, save you hundreds of thousands of dollars as well as keeps you off a federal watch list, which is always great. If you liked the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you disliked the video, uh, just pretend you didn't watch it. If you wanna see more videos like this, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and let us know in the comments below what you wanna see us discuss next. As always, thank you for your time. Stay safe and happy hacking. Thank you.